I'd like to introduce Lord Hutton, who, as well as being chairman of RUSI, uh, has a long and distinguished career, uh, much of which is directly related to the issues we are talking about. And I think it's particularly appropriate, uh, given what David Jarvis has just said, that he has experience on both sides of the nuclear business uh, as Secretary of State for Defence, uh, but also in his current uh, role as Chairman of the Nuclear Industry Association, now, um, and therefore perhaps uniquely paced uh, to talk about uh, the subjects of our, uh, of our conference. So without further ado, Lord Hutton, over to you. Thank you very much, Malcolm, for that uh, introduction. I, I was sort of touched by your reference to a gathering of stars of the future. That doesn't include me any anymore, sadly. Um, but it's a great pleasure to be here, uh, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, say a few words uh, on, on these very, very important issues. Um, the birth of the modern nuclear age, as we all know, began in 1945 with the dropping of atomic weapons on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I think these acts represented perhaps one of the, the defining moments in the history of mankind, after which nothing would quite be the same again, and from which there would clearly be no return possible to a, to a pre-nuclear age. Thereafter, the race to develop and acquire nuclear weapons by the ideologically opposed victors of the war dominated the global geopolitical environment for the best part of 40 years until the fall of communism in 1989 uh, and the effective end of the Cold War. And of course, it, that race itself has left uh, an indelible mark on the world. And those looking back on that period might justifiably ask, how did we ever make it out of the Cold War alive? That question perhaps has most resonance when we consider the events of the 14 days in October 1962 that have become known as the Cuban Missile Crisis. Causes of the crisis have been widely rehearsed and analyzed by historians and I don't think need detain us very long this morning. But the effects of that standoff between the USA and the USSR that brought the world to the brink of nuclear war were profound both politically and also psychologically. It could be argued that the terror engendered by the Cuban Missile Crisis cemented the concept and strategy of mutually assured destruction. It argues that no one would dare use atomic weapons or nuclear weapons and risk nuclear war for fear of immediate reprisal and what Winston Churchill had foreseen as the equality of annihilation. If no one could be sure of surviving a nuclear war, it wouldn't happen. And of course, thankfully, that turned out to be true. That realization and fear of instant annihilation led the superpowers to seek political ways to manage and control their nuclear weapons. The series of agreements began with the Limited Test Ban Treaty in 1963, which abolished atmospheric nuclear tests. It carried on throughout the following decade with the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty in 1968 that required states with nuclear weapons not to assist others to acquire them. And in 1972, of course, the Strategic Arms Limitation Interim Agreement, which together with the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty in the same year, placed a limit on the number of ballistic missiles allowed on each side and banned defenses against long-range missiles. All of these measures became the basis for a more stable, if not a very comfortable, Soviet-American relationship. By extension, one could argue that that resulted in a more stable global political environment, but one that has been sorely tested since the collapse of the Soviet Union and the emergence of different and less predictable threats to our collective security. Of course, one of the abiding characteristics of the Cold War, more or less from the end of the World War in 1945 through the 1950s and beyond, was a mood of paranoia and fear of nuclear war that infected whole societies. In the USA, for example, it was the era of the McCarthyite witch hunts and the Hollywood blacklists conducted through the House Un-American Activities Committee. And that general mood of paranoia was even widely reflected and encouraged by popular culture with films and TV shows featuring the fear of invasion and tales of espionage as subjects of mass entertainment. Certainly, superpower rivalry and fear of possible nuclear war 
had a powerful grip on the public imagination. And I think it is undeniable that the fear of nuclear weapons coloured then and has continued to colour many people's perceptions of all things nuclear, including the peaceful uses of nuclear technology. And this, in my view, goes a very long way indeed to explaining the controversy and anxiety that still surrounds nuclear energy. It is also, I think, undeniable that the civil applications of nuclear energy had their origins in the same Manhattan project that produced the atomic weapons dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yet as early as 19, 6, 1953, President Eisenhower's Atoms for Peace initiative launched the widespread development of civilian nuclear technology for the production of economic, safe, and efficient electricity that I think has brought very, very significant benefits to the world. In those early days, it was difficult to make the distinction between the civil and military uses of nuclear technology. And at that time, the distinction was indeed blurred as electricity was a byproduct of, plut of plutonium production for weapons purposes. But as electricity production became the primary objective, the distinction became clearer. And the growth of civil nuclear technology became much more widespread until it is now deployed in over 30 countries and accounts for over 17% of world electricity production. Now, there are sound uh, technical and economic reasons why the abuse of civil nuclear technology for weapons production is, in fact, not a sensible way to proceed. But even when the link between the technologies is potentially most prone to misuse, for example, in the practices of fuel enrichment and reprocessing, the non-proliferation treaty that came into force in 1970 has, in fact, been largely effective in detecting and preventing the diversion of civil nuclear materials to weapons production and enforcing the split between the two. The international expansion of civil nuclear energy to the point where there are now today over 440 reactors operating worldwide has not led to widespread proliferation of nuclear weapons. It was widely assumed in the 1960s, for example, when the non-proliferation treaty was first opened for signature, that as many as perhaps between 20 and 30 nuclear weapon states would pretty soon emerge. In fact, while there are around 30 countries operating nuclear power stations, there are still only five declared nuclear weapon states, and fewer what we might call threshold states, either with weapons or weapons capability. 190 countries have ratified the NPT, more than any other arms limitation and disarmament agreement, which I believe is a testament to the treaty's significance. The civil nuclear industry here in the UK supports the objectives and application of the NPT and fully complies with the IAEA safeguards and inspection regimes. Companies operating civil nuclear facilities would be concerned that any perceived link between their activities and weapons proliferation could tarnish their corporate reputation and fundamentally damage their businesses. It is important that the NPT continues to be robust and effective in detecting and deterring any diversion of materials from civil facilities to military purposes, and that sanctions, effective sanctions are available to enforce compliance. Clearly, we cannot afford to be complacent about the risks of proliferation especially in an era increasingly characterized by terrorism rather than superpower conflict. We have to be vigilant both in pursuing and strengthening non-proliferation measures through the IAEA in stakes like Iran and North Korea, and in avoiding the diversion and possible use of nuclear materials by terrorists through effective counter-terrorism measures and international security cooperation. Again, the nuclear industry supports effective and enhanced nuclear security. And there are a number of ways in which it can assist in those areas. For example, by collaborating to establish a multilateral fuel cycle service, such as fuel banks and enrichment, so that countries can have access to these services without the need to create them from within their own borders. We can also envisage in, uh, engage in R&D into technologies with lower proliferation risks. Though we have to be realistic, I think there is going to be no way of putting the genie back into the bottle completely. But through sharing non-proliferation and security best practice and assisting fledgling nuclear power programs to develop and strengthen their competence in regulation, 
safety and effective export controls. The nuclear industry can do its part in helping governments and international agencies to address the obvious dangers of proliferation. And I think we should always remain vigilant in preventing the spread of nuclear weapons. I think that's a sine qua non. But it is not just the spread of nuclear weapons that threatens global security. And I'll just ask you all to consider the following statistics. In 1950, the world population was around 2.5 billion. Last year, it reached 7 billion and is estimated to be over 9 billion by 2050, more than a tripling uh, of the global population in less than a century. Populations of China and India are each more than 1 billion, and together they account for over a third of the world's total population. In addition to their anticipated population growth, economic growth in those countries is expected to outstrip that of the OECD nations, to the extent that by 2050, China's GDP will be almost equivalent to that of the USA, and India's almost 60%. Accompanying that trend will be an increase in global energy demand of at least 50% by 2035 in just over 20 years. And my own personal view, for what it's worth, is that electricity demand will be much greater than that. And those are the International Energy Agency's figures. 90% of that increased demand will be in non-OECD countries, or perhaps as we should no longer call it, the developing world. The estimated cost of investment needed to accommodate that increase in energy demand is a staggering $38,000 billion. Yet at present, a fifth of the world's population still does not have access to electricity and the benefits that it brings. Much of Africa literally remains a dark continent. The strains on resources, on water, food, and energy supply, that population economic growth, and meeting the needs and aspirations of people for access to better living standards is going to be immense. So too will be the challenges to the world's ability to mobilize and deliver the technology and the financial investment required. Now, if all of that wasn't enough, all of those challenges are exacerbated by the fact of global climate change and the need to support that scale of growth in a sustainable way. Unless the global demand for energy and transport can be met with substantially reduced reliance on fossil fuels, temperature increases in the range of, in the range of perhaps between 3.5 and, and 6 degrees centigrade are very likely to occur. Now, there may be some climate change deniers here. That's a debate perhaps for, a, for another occasion. But the scientists do tell us very clearly that temperature rises of that order could have catastrophic consequences, leading to more unstable weather patterns and extreme events, flooding of low-lying low, low countries and increased desertification in other regions, rendering many parts of the globe uninhabitable, causing perhaps widespread migration of populations displaced by dramatic environmental changes. And the warning signs are, are there. The question is whether we are doing enough to respond to an impending global crisis. The answer is probably no, and we could undoubtedly and should undoubtedly do more. But in energy supply, there are at least firm indications of moves towards greater deployment of low-carbon technologies, including renewables and nuclear energy. The recent strong global revival of interest in developing new nuclear energy is a, is a recognition, I believe, of the fact that it is a key source of large-scale and reliable low-carbon electricity, and that it has a significant role to play in addressing concerns about energy security, climate change, and especially in developing countries, the urgent need to meet rapidly rising energy, de energy demand. And those same drivers, energy security as we become more reliant on imported sources of energy, and climate change, are also behind the UK's own new nuclear build program. Industry estimates show that there could be over 200 new reactors ordered worldwide by the end of this decade. More than 60 are currently being constructed. Over 80% of the projected new build is likely in countries with existing nuclear capacity, with by far the largest programs in the fastest developing economies. China, where 26 reactors are today under construction, 50 new reactors are planned, and 120 proposed. In India, there are seven new nuclear reactors under construction, 16 planned and 40 proposed. There is expansion, too, in countries and regions that are new to nuclear, such as the Middle East, where nuclear energy will be used for desalination as well as electricity production. 
Undoubtedly, the events last year at Fukushima, the result of an unprecedented natural disaster, which has claimed the lives of at least 20,000 people, has naturally had a, a fairly profound impact on the nuclear industry worldwide and provoked strong political and public reactions, particularly here in Europe, as well as intense global media interest. The industry is responding and will continue to respond positively to the lessons from that accident with humility and a determination to ensure that its good safety record is maintained into the future. Inevitably, um, it has caused governments and nuclear industries around the world to pause and reflect on their plans for the future development of nuclear energy. But most countries today that have planned new nuclear programs have remained committed to them. So my final set of comments, Malcolm, is this, that nuclear energy, civil nuclear energy, uh, can play, I think, a significant role in helping steer a course for the world through all of these enormous challenges that we face. Population growth, climate change, economic development. Energy is the key to all of those. But having said that, I'm not claiming today that nuclear energy provides a silver bullet solution to the energy and environmental problems we face today. But on the fundamental question of how we can best secure our energy future, there remains, in my view, a vital need for an expansion of nuclear energy to help combat global carbon emissions and to provide reliable, economic, and secure supplies of electricity, particularly to those nations around the globe experiencing rapid population growth, industrial expansion, and rising energy demand. The peaceful uses of nuclear energy, despite its genesis in acts of destruction, can and must contribute to improving greater stability, security, and resilience against the severe threats to the peace of the world we are now facing. Thank you very much indeed. Well, well thank you very much indeed, Lord Hutton. I think you've done exactly what we asked you to do and more, uh, really provide uh, an overview of uh, the broad picture within which we are going to burrow down into specific topics throughout the day and shown how interwoven uh, the military and civilian sides of this debate are, starting uh, with uh, Hiroshima, Cuban Missile Crisis, and then coming right up to the present day and some of the challenges we face going forward. <laughs>